Right, this is a conference about the future. The future is something that potentially can be very different from today. But I'm not talking about the future thousands or hundreds of years in the future. I'm talking potentially about the near term future, things that conceivably within the next 10 to 25 years, well within the expected lifetime of many people in this audience, could end up changing things radically different from the present and indeed from any era of their past history. And the cause of the difference is the technology which is rapidly improving and challenging so many of the ways of thinking that historically have dominated. So that's what this conference is about. And we're going to hear speakers talking about these technologies and how they might, as, as I said, in such a short amount of time, uh, change how things operate. So what kind of rapidly improving technology are we talking about? And there's a lot, and I'm just going to touch on a couple. You see this guy or woman in the badge. We've all got a copy of this logo on your name badge. This person's brain seems to be on fire, supercharged. How did she, he or she get into this super smart state? Well, perhaps by a combination of ancient and modern meditation practices, perhaps by a combination of ancient and modern tantric yoga, but also perhaps by taking advantage of the vastly improving knowledge we've got of how the brain actually works, the biochemical and lots of other levels. And we can bring drugs already in the present, increasingly will be possible to change how the brain operates. We've already got drugs that make us into better athletes if we want, make us into better sexual athletes if we want, and of course the brain is a more complex organ, but as we're understanding it more increasingly, there's going to be pressure in competitive situations if you're doing an exam or your children's doing an exam, or if it's a tough negotiation at work or you're going for an interview, there'll be great pressure to take advantage of these drugs to make yourself think faster and harder in that moment. And that's only the start. We're seeing lots of enhancements to manufacturing capabilities. More and more people will have 3D printers that allow increasingly complex things to be assembled. This is the hint of what nanotechnology can do, the ability to manipulate matter at the molecular level. This is starting, it's coming on strong with synthetic biology, which allows us to change not just inanimate organs, but also increasingly the molecules of life, or molecules that we create, but which have many of the characteristics of life. So we will be programming not just in silicon, not just in changing how uh, present day computers work, but increasingly we'll be programming at the DNA or carbon level too. This has lots of opportunities to create new sources of clean energy, the mechanisms to repair the terrible damage we've committed to the environment, but also with this ability to program at that molecular level will allow us to increasingly repair our organs so that if something's wrong with our organ, we won't have to rely on a transplant, we'll be able to have one grown specially from our own stem cells. And increasingly with this repair mechanisms, as some of the speakers will touch on, there will be possibilities to significantly extend human healthy lifespan. And this is where things start getting really radical. Potential radical changes that with this technology, with the repairs that take place, people could live indefinitely long. It's a huge challenge to many of the assumptions that have guided thinking throughout history. But we might already be living in the days of the last mortal generation that might be in the process of passing away around us and we might have in our midst the first indefinitely long-lived generation. And if that's not radical enough, the other, the second radical possibility that is opened by the technology that is rapidly improving, another huge challenge is that computers could become soon smarter all around than humans, not just better at playing chess, not just better at finding a navigation route through a complex city, but answering all kinds of questions that are defeating current human intellect. It will look at a vast amount of medical data and say, try this, this drug will cure this cancer. It will look at vast amount of economic data and say, do this, this will fix the macroeconomic uh, problems that the, the society is facing. Not only will it uh, potentially in the next 10 to 25 years be able to answer these intellectual questions, I'm expecting the possibility of these computers writing even better music than Mozart 
Beethoven, Lenin and McCartney, writing literature better, and not just disembodied computers, but also when we combine them with modern materials, there will be robots amongst us that are much more personable, friendly, likable and helpful than current day humans. That's some of the possibilities, but it's only a potential. The near term future may be radically different from the present if the technology develops along these ways. But none of this is inevitable. And the big thing that this conference will be looking at is well, what action can we influence and what are the likely scenarios? One interesting book, not by a, a transhumanist, uh, just by a normal professor of the history of business. The Master Switch by Tim Wu looks, uh, and this is a well worth reading if you want a <laughs> source of lots of interesting stories. He discusses lots of the technological changes over the last 140 years since the invention of the telephone, uh, many of the other internet information technologies, movies, television, radio, and how many things could well have been very different. In some cases, uh, Technologies were held up for many years before becoming adopted. In some cases, uh, industry speeding things up, and some things regulation speeding things up or slowed them down. So nothing is inevitable. So that is why I'm laying out these five key questions for all people interested in the future. Questions that I think the, the speakers today will be addressing. So there is a lot of hype. There's a lot of a uh, bit lazy thinking sometimes in this space but there is a lot of reality to these projections of technological capabilities too. So the question is, not just in broad terms, what in more detail are the realistic scenarios, plural, there's not just a singular outcome, what are the realistic scenarios for radical progress in technology that not only makes us smarter, but also makes us wiser, that not only makes us stronger and fitter, but also makes us kinder, that not only gives us more technology and more gadgets, but makes us happier, that not only makes us able to live longer, but able to live more deeply fulfilled, not just for a short period of time, but for a longer and definite period of time, and not just for the fortunate few, but for all people, all humanity. So that is the potential upside. And I will briefly give my answer to that. I say, yes, there are indeed realistic scenarios in which this could happen well within the lifetimes of many people here today. But there's more than just upside. There is potential big downside to a lot of the technologies that people will be talking about today. So, futurists must think hard about the serious risks, including the existential risks from this technology, that if things go wrong could wipe out all that's meaningful to us. And you will hear speakers talking about that too. Addressing what is the role of technology in worsening some of these great risks, but also in fixing some of these great risks, and therefore allowing us to move through that period of great stress and great risk into uh, the better phase of evolution. And indeed this brings us in some ways to a more profound question which is, okay, if this technology is coming, if technology is merging with biology, if us in the future will have lots of uh, silicon or computer technology as part of our human beings, if the, the robots will have lots of the biological aspects too, what does that mean <laughs> for what it means to be human? And is it something to aspire to? Humanity Plus talks about a new phase of evolution in which the powers and experiences of us who inherit this possibility will be as far above those of present humans as human experience exceeds that of pre-human apes. Is that desirable or not? Some people are very frightened by that possibility and they throw up their hands and say, no, 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 we can't have it. But I will say, yes, there are risks, but this is a very desirable outcome and we should make it happen. And that brings me to, in some ways, the most important question, not just could it happen, but if we like this idea, what could we as individuals do as activists to support Humanity Plus? After all, it has been said by many others, the point is not just to interpret the world, it is to change it. So if those of you in the audience like this idea and want to be part of making this more uh, real, uh, safer, uh, and uh, progress, I invite you to, first of all, join the Battle of Ideas. The Battle of Ideas has just started, it's going to get more intense as the possibilities become more vivid and people can see that actually it is just around the corner. There are many people who say, no, 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 humanity is already somehow final or perfect and we can't improve it. There are two versions of this thinking. One says humanity has been created by God or gods 
and that's the limit, we can't do better. Another view says, well, humanity has been created by natural evolution, and that's so complex that we can't possibly do better than that. And I disagree strongly with both of these arguments. There are more modern versions of these. Somehow says, well, you know, mortalism is good, it's good to die. There's no point if, if people didn't die, then life would be somehow uh, made less important and less significant. So I invite you to challenge these ideas and get involved in that debate. But the backup ideas are two sides, not just uh, rejecting some of these more traditional uh, mortalist and deathist views, but also we have to be very wary of a lot of the uh, hype and uh, inappropriate uh, optimism that uh, some uh, writers in this field look at when they say it's all going to happen automatically and uh, it's all a bed of roses. There is a lot of challenges that need to be faced, as I said, and we have to fight that part of the battle of ideas too. But more than just ideas, I'm looking for people, and I think there are many in the audience who have already taken the step, to actually creating these technologies, not just talking about them. So either by engineering or in some cases, as happens in many of the breakthroughs, hacking. Sometimes even hacking themselves. And I think we're going to hear the next speaker addressing some of that topic. So let's get involved as students studying the subject that will make a difference, as business people steering our businesses in these directions. Also get involved in, if we're not engineers, we could be artists or writers, write fiction, write art that supports these ideas and presents them in a positive light, whereas often, in Hollywood, these ideas are seen as somewhat dystopian, or fearful, or ugly, or somehow uh, uh, undeveloped. There's a lot to be done there to highlight these. And last but not least, I invite you to join in uh, nurturing this community, building social links, connecting people together, and, for those of you who can, to help fund some of the projects or meetings or activities that you'll hear about in this event. And the last appeal I've got is that we should bring Humanity Plus ideas across the chasm to wider appeal. Those of you who know me from my work setting as an enthusiast for smartphone technologies may have seen me use this picture before. It is a picture of a naive way of looking at how technology gets adopted or how innovation spreads. The view that there's just a straightforward continuum. That you start off with uh, geeks who like technology for its own sake, then there are people who like it because they can jump ahead and see the applications. And then there are people who adopted before the majority, and then right off at the right hand side, you've got the Daily Telegraph readers or whatever, who, uh, and when hell freezes over. But this is a naive view, and Jeffrey Bull, who has written on this with great, uh, with great eloquence, points out there is a significant difference, which he calls the chasm, between these early adopters who like technology and features and the mainstream who want a different kind of validation. They're not looking for technology, they're looking for something meaningful in terms of complete solutions, reliability and convenience. The early group are able to put up with poor usability or poor sociability. The mainstream are looking for good usability and good sociability. And many technology companies die in that chasm because they just try and keep on doing the same as got their early interest up. And those of us who want to support Humanity Plus have got to bring real solutions which are concrete and reliable to people. Jeffrey Moore talks about crossing the chasm with some bowling pins or killer apps, and that is what I'm looking to see in today's meeting as well. Stars who are not just appealing to gurus, but are appealing to grandmas. Uh, people who are not just a technology uh, liking for its own sake, but who are able to see, yes, this is how it fits into my life. So, I invite you to uh, join this uh, battle of ideas, get involved as engineers, and today start to make more of a human difference. Thank you very much.